surgery, stop their heart, finish the surgery, put them back together, start the heart electrically, and bring the person back without a heart-lung machine because there wasn't any heart-lung machine. And that's how they did the first uh, open-heart surgeries. How Pretty, fascinating. It's very fascinating. Very fascinating. It, it's very impractical because you have to have a surgical chamber which costs millions of dollars and you can't move it around. It you know, might weigh 25,000 pounds. So it's a very immobile and that makes it impractical. So the heart-lung machine is much more practical. But the heart-lung machine does have some problems. It's, uh, it's been found to uh, perhaps be responsible for uh, dementia problems after heart surgery. And uh, there's a lot of possible reasons for that. But uh, whatever they are, they're working on them and trying to work them out. Let's talk about the sports medicine applications, and then I want to talk about cancer with you. First of all, explain the context of the sports medicine injuries and how hyperbaric processes happen. Well, uh, let me talk about philosophy first. Number one, <clears throat> sports injuries cost somebody lots of money. When an uh, athlete is injured and they're on the bench rather than in the field playing, it's costing money, and that's not a good thing. They don't want to lose money. With hyperbarics, you can accelerate healing dramatically. How dramatically? My personal experience is 40 to 50% faster. That's dramatic. So if you have somebody who's injured and you want them back in the game in two weeks instead of four, four and a half weeks, you give them hyperbarics every day, sometimes twice a day, in the morning and in the late afternoon. It will reduce edema, of course, reducing swelling, inflammation, it will grow new blood vessels. There's that angiogenesis again. The growth of new blood vessels brings blood and oxygen to the site. And when there's an injury, there's usually a damage to blood vessels. I don't know uh, how many people are truly aware uh, that some of the blood vessels in our body are so tiny that uh, it literally could take five to ten of them to match the size of one human hair, which makes them vulnerable, very, very vulnerable. So... When you are traumatized, thousands of blood vessels will break or be compromised. And the faster you can grow them back to supply the blood and the oxygen, the faster is the healing process. Very interesting. So that's money-driven, as is the case with racehorses and hyperbaric chambers. Oh, I've never heard of that. Talk oh, my about goodness. that. I have a picture in my lobby of a racehorse going into the hyperbaric chamber. Well, you know, this particular horse probably worth $5 million, okay? And uh, got injured uh, and caught, and, and as a result of the injury, caught a severe infection, something that we would, uh, we would uh, equate to necrotizing fasciitis or the flesh-eating bacteria. Well, what are they going to do? The horse is going to die. And... Uh, you know, usually they don't like a horse to just linger. They they usually help it along with some euthanasia process. And uh, the horse now can go into a hyperbaric chamber and be healed within 20 to 25 treatments, saving $5 million, which is phenomenal. Wow. You must have big machines to fit a horse. <laughs> well, these machines, the, these machines are made by a company that specializes in making hyperbaric chambers for horses. And I have seen a couple of things throughout the world um, that just really blasted me. Um, one of them is, uh, is a uh, chamber that's made to look like a trailer because the horses are used to getting in those trailers. And they're used to riding in the trailers from one race track to the next because that's their mode of transportation. So I've seen this chamber, and I really had to laugh because they had uh, they had vibrators where the wheels were, and the vibrators where the wheels were would go on when the horse was being uh, transferred to a different location, and the horse was shaking and it thought it was riding. So it tolerated the hyperbaric treatment very well without a problem. And then I saw another chamber that was made with a window in the front. And this window was made to uh, be, be facing the inside of a big barn with a panoramic screen on it. And on that panoramic screen 
would be uh, projected the image of a highway of, of scenery and the highway passing by. So when the horse is in there getting the hyperbaric treatment and they put the chamber into this barn, the horse gets the feeling of riding with the shaking and vibration and also uh, has the scenery and it thinks it's on its way somewhere. So it's it tolerates. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of such a thing. That's wild. It's wild. But it works. It works, yeah. Wow. Let's talk about the really, really difficult part, and that is cancer. Before we begin, do you have to be, or does the industry or the groups that are using hyperbaric treatments have to be under the radar with respect to talking to cancer patients and having them be patients? No, no, because we don't treat cancer. We don't treat cancer. We leave that to the oncologists. We leave that to the specialists who are, who are doing it. What we do is we use hyperbaric oxygen therapy to facilitate the two main cancer therapies, which are chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Now, I don't know if you know this or if the people listening know this, but hyperbaric oxygen therapy is approved for reimbursement which is very rare because there are not many conditions approved for insurance reimbursement uh, for radiation poisoning because it works. It really is effective at helping to reduce the symptoms of and the uh, problems that are a result of radiation poisoning. So, And it will also help the body accept and make more efficient the results of radiation therapy. So we will then use hyperbaric therapy in conjunction with the schedule for chemotherapy so as to make the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy more effective and less obtrusive in terms of side effects, which is what happens. So this takes it out of the realm of treating cancer in an illegal fashion because all you're doing, and if you have a if you have a uh, uh, oncologist who it has enough uh, understanding and willingness and open-mindedness to understand what we're doing, uh, they, will, they will be able to adjust the dosages to make up for the difference in uh, effectiveness because, for example, if we use hyperbarics, most of the time there may be a higher level of effectiveness of the radiation or the chemo, so you might want to reduce it a little bit, see? So those are the things you have to look at, but there's nothing illegal about it. Have you ever had people call you up and say, I don't have cancer, I don't have a sports injury, and I don't have any diseases that I know of, but I want to come do this. Would it be good for me? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, that happens all the time. Um, and there are a lot of people who, and you'd be surprised at people who own hyperbaric chambers, but they do it very quietly. Uh, they they don't want people to come and use them because that would be uh, inappropriate um, but their doctor can write a prescription for oxygen therapy for someone, and they can get a hyperbaric chamber at home. Um, they're expensive. Michael Jackson did that when he got burned in the Pepsi commercial. I remember that. He uh, got burned, and uh, he was given uh, orders to go to the hospital every day for hyperbaric therapy for a while, and he chose not to make a public spectacle of, of himself, and he just simply bought a hyperbaric chamber, had it installed in his house, used it, healed beautifully through that whole mess, and then sold it. People do that a lot. We have a lot of people who, and they can rent them too, and there's a different kind of chamber now available. It's called a soft chamber. It doesn't have the uh, incredible medical possibilities that a steel and glass chamber does, but it's, uh, it does increase your oxygen levels, your dissolved oxygen levels. It's kind of like a balloon you're in a balloon, and uh, you zip it up with a special sealing zipper and turn on a compressor, and it goes up to about three pounds per square inch, which if you were in a treatment in a uh, hyperbaric facility, you could uh, easily go up to 30 pounds per square inch. Wow. So that there's a big difference. But the lesser uh, level does cause oxygen to dissolve in your body, and that's kind of exciting. Is there a way in the day-to-day -day that you're aware of to oxygenate our blood aside from going into this process? Well, not not the, at the same level. There's no way because... Right, I get that. But, but to, to uh, increase...